welcome to the program. This is What's Your Story. I am Catherine Mwangi. Thank you so much for tuning in today to the show. We are here at the Villa Rosa Kempinski and grateful to the management for availing their beautiful ballroom for us to bring this story to you today. The story of the Director General of the UN Office in Nairobi, Zainab Hawa Bangura. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I hope I've pronounced your name perfect. You did. Oh, thank you. And you look beautiful. Thank you. This is very special to us. Thank you very much. I always like to tell my story because yeah? it's an inspiration to people. It is. So growing up, your family, tell us about that. What was that like? I actually w was born in the most traditional part of Sierra Leone, okay. which is the north, mm -hmm. where in women up to today, as I speak to you, can easily not own land. Oh. They are still parts of the husband's property when the husband die. Oh. You know, cannot be traditional leaders and do not believe in the girl child education. The high school I went to mm -hmm. is the cheapest in the country. It's the only government girls school for the north because girls in the north don't go to school. Then my father is also a Muslim cleric who does not believe in the education of the girl child. But my mom grew up, she was taken to the city as a house help. So she saw girls in the community in which she lived were going to school. Right. So she made it as a commitment that, you know, when she grows up, she will have, she will educate her children. children. I turned out to be an only child. I was the only child and a girl. Mm -hmm. My mom was married to a Muslim cleric who do not believe. So at the age of 12, mm -hmm. my father wanted to marry me off. My mom said no, and he threw us out. Oh my so my mom and I went to the village. So I grew up in the village, which became home to me, this very traditional village. But she made it, it was very difficult because we were extremely poor. Yeah. You know, um, we went to bed several times without food. But my mom said to me, if you get an education, you'll be anything you want to be in this world. Yes. So she, she, she instilled, me, instilled it in my head that the only way I can move from the poverty that, that we are going through was mm -hmm. to get an education. So I went to boarding school, it was a very cheap school. At the time I got, at our time it was from five. Mm -hmm. She lost everything, she, did, she couldn't afford. So I was going to be thrown out of school. Right. But the principal, who is also happened to come from the north, wrote a special request to the government that they have, I was a senior prefect the most brilliant girl, and wow. said, ask the government a special request to give me a special scholarship to finish high school, which they did. Mm. And I finished high school. Yeah. I went to Form 6. I, w I moved to the city. My mom found a place for me. Right. She, she, she paid for a year, and she couldn't. But she was a very active woman in the community. Yeah. So she, uh, there was a politician who came to the village who wanted to contest election and they told her my mom will support if my mom supports her he will win. Yeah. So my mom supported him and he won. He mm -hmm. was made Minister of Trade and Industry. He asked my mom, Can I build a house for you or can I send you to Hajj? My mom said, No, I have one child and she needs to finish school. So my mom literally handed me over to him. So he supported me and he was able to help me finish from six. Mm. And then he helped me to get a scholarship to go to university. So I went to, I went to university with five dresses, one slippers, one school, one sandal. And you know the hand luggage suitcase you now yeah. use for hand luggage. That's the suitcase I went to university with. So that's how it started. But yeah, and the rest is story. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest we are going to be unraveling as we move along. I know. So what exactly did this did your mom do for this politician that he wanted to come and you know say thank he, you? He was my mom I think I took after her. now as I looked in retrospect, yeah. she was a leader in her community. She's ah, come from the, the big town. Yes. She's gone back because when her father threw us out, she went back to the village. She was, became very active. She's illiterate, mm -hmm. but I used to tease her. So every time UNICEF and these other people come to do programs in the village, they always identify her because she's very bold. Yeah. She was not educated, but she's very active. Yeah. So she sort of, we have this thing they call mommy queen, mm -hmm. like women leaders in the village. She was like a woman leader in the village, very active. Yes. So this politician came, he wanted to look for people who can actually help him. And they pointed, they said, if this woman helps him, Mami yeah. Sama, that's the caller, yeah. she helps you win. So okay. my mother said, my mother didn't ask him for money. She mm -mm. said, okay, I'll support you. And she campaigned for him and he won. Mm -hmm. 
Ooh. And he was made minister of trade. Yes. And then he wanted to pay her back. And by divine providence, your education was taken care of. My education was taken care of. What did you study in university? I studied law as a subject, history, arts. I started my in high school, I wanted to be a doctor. Okay. Because I didn't have the opportunity. So I, I did science until I, I got to form five and then I switched over to liberal arts. So I went to university, I studied arts. And then I, my first career was in the insurance industry. I had to choose a job which will give me sufficient income to look after myself and my mom. So my first job was at the insurance industry. Hmm. And then of course I was there, I was determined. I always have this ambition to be the best. I don't yes. compete with people, I compete with myself. That's one of my philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I joined the insurance industry and I decided I have to have the highest qualification in insurance. Yeah. And I did that. I got a scholarship, I went to England, North University and City University Business School. And I, I got a fellowship in insurance. Hmm. So I became number two in my insurance. And then during that time, I was very close to my mom, and then she died. Oh, wow. How old were you? Uh, I was actually in my early 30s when she died. Okay. The shock of it was when she died, I had to look for my father to bury my mom. Because the, 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 the culture where we come from, m my husband had not got married to him yet. We were living together. Mm -hmm. He couldn't bury my mom. No. So I had to look for my father because she was still technically legally married to him, according yes. to our culture. Yes. It was cultural, not legally. Yes. Cultural. So he had to come for the funeral. And then he said that my late, later my husband, the person I was dating, mm -hmm. cannot participate in the funeral eh? because I was not legally married to him. So I had to put my mom's corpse and went to the mosque, got married and give him the authority to come and bury my mom. That's how I got married. <laughs> On the day of my mom's funeral. It's when you got married. I had to get married to give him the authority to bury my mom. Wow. And how did you even find your dad? Well, I knew where he was. Sierra Leone is small. It's not like Kenya. Yeah. We're 7 million. Even that, I think, is <laughs> it's like, it's 7 million. Yeah. I think we're not up to 7 million. Mm -hmm. So we know each other. You go to Sierra Leone, you call my name. Two, three people, somebody will know me. We're very small. Yeah. You know, so we know, I know where he was. Mm. We just didn't have a relationship. Yeah. You know, but of course, when my mom died, we had to tra track him down, call him on the phone, and yeah. he had to come to the village. Yes. You know, so. Yes. And after the funeral, I knew something was wrong. Because I couldn't believe here was my father. And my father, of course, loved me. Mm -hmm. I learned Arabic before I learned English. Uh, we were very close as a family. But okay. because of his own values, his religious values, which took us apart. So I had that kind of, I said, he's left us, he's abandoned us, mm -hmm. we grew up mm -hmm. under very, very difficult circumstances. We went to bed many times without food. Mm. And yet this is a man who had to dictate my life. So after my mom died, I went to the city and I went straight to UNDP and I said, luckily the head of the UNDP at that time was a woman. And I said, I, said, I don't understand. And I went to see her to ask for advice. And then she smiled. Mm -hmm. She said, this is what we talk about women's rights. Mm -hmm. Because th that was when she explained to me, mm -hmm. we, we have the, the constitution recognizes cultural, religious, and traditional laws. Okay. So it depends on which parts of the country you come, yeah. your whole life is structured around those laws. So, for example, I'm Muslim. Right. Inheritance, childbearing, whatever is according to the Islamic law. If I come from that tradition, the traditional leaders have a responsibility. Yes. You know. So I said, so what can I do? She said, if you can help me to get women together. She said, since I came, but it was a taboo. You know, like at some point in my country, you can't talk about FGM. Because mm. there are certain things you can't touch. The things about, about women's rights at that time, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of taboo. Nobody wants to touch it. So I said, okay, tell me what you want me to do. Right. She told me, and then we mobilized women. That's why I, I started, I became a women's rights activist. For my story, my beginning, I just thought it was very unfair. Okay. You know, so I said, what do we do? So we started mobilizing. We needed to have a national conference on women's rights. We had the conference. Then we had a coup. We had a military coup. You know, and the means through the constitution was suspended. Right. So we couldn't talk about rights. So I then realized if I need to fight for women's rights, I think I need to shift and start fighting for democracy. Oh. So I became an activist. You know, and I, I took women into the streets. I became, I led a campaign to, to get the military off. So I was the champion in my country and fought the military, fought in the streets, led campaigns, led demonstrations, 
eventually. And at the same time, we had a war. Yes. While all this was going on. Right. We had a war. So the military decided that we cannot have an election because we need to have the peace process. Right. We came to the conclusion, post-war post reconstruction is a lot of money. Money comes into your country, like Rwanda and the others. How can I put those money into the hands of an elected leaders? Hmm. So we said no. So we said we can also have, so we, the, the campaign was election before peace or peace before election. Mm -hmm. So I led a campaign of election before peace. Mm. So we, we went into the election. It was a very difficult experience yes. and I was targeted so many times, you know. Most of the times I can't sleep in my house. Oh. You know, I have to sleep in different embassies. For your you protection. Know, for my protection. Yes. So we had the first democratic election in three, in three decades. Because we had a long years of 27 years of one party rule. Right. And then we had the military. Yes. In the middle of it, we had the war. So we had elections. It was not the best election, but for us, it was a start. Yes. You know, and so after the election, I sat back and then I realized I can't go back to insurance. My life has changed. Mm. There's so many things I need to fight for. Women's rights, democracy, good governance, corruption. Corruption was not really the things that led to the war in Syria, right, right. mismanagement of state resources. Yes. So I went to my insurance company. I was the number two. I said to my, my boss, I said, I don't think I'll be able to come back. Because I took time off to focus to on all and, this demonstration yes, yes, and everything. the campaigning and everything. So, yeah. I, I, so I agreed with the board and I took and I set up an organization which became Campaign for Good Governance, became mm -hmm. the biggest human rights organization in the country. We were documenting the atrocities of the war. And we're campaigning for democracy. We train ministers, you know, training for the judiciary. This was the war. Most of the judges who had been trained, who were actually sitting at the judiciary, have never done human rights training. No. Never. Because these are people in their 50s, in yes, their 40s. Yes. I mean, at that time, human rights was just a concept. Yes. So because of the war, because of the atrocities that committed during the war, we had to make sure human rights become part and parcel of our laws in Sierra mm, Leone. So there was a lot of changes that had to take place. We had to have anti-corruption commission, so many things. So I decided, no, I yeah. don't want to be in insurance. No more insurance. I, I do in it. So I ran my NGO. Okay, so we before you go there, before you go there, there's something tagging at me. Um, let me just track you back a bit. Uh, when you were done with, you know, sending your farewell to your mom, and, and you said that you walked to this UNDP office. What prompted that? Because you see, you're already in insurance. You could easily have decided to go back to work, you know, normal, normal work, whatever it is you're doing before. But you went, you, you just, what was that transition and how quick My was mother it? was my best friend. Yes. I was an only child. She was my backbone. She was an inspiration to me. And I have to tell you, I've still not recovered from her death. 30 years after she died. Every time I visit her grave in the village, I cry. She was the only person I had. I had no sister. She had an only sister. So she, she was my life. Losing her and being forced not to do what I can. I think the pain was too much for me. Mm -hmm. And I just said, my father was not rich. But then when we were together, at least they could manage father and mother. Mm -hmm. But when he left us, we suffered. We really, really did suffer. Mm. It was very difficult. My mother had left the village for a long time. She'd been in the city. Then she had to come back to the village. She was doing petty trading. It was tough. Mm. And most of the time, she couldn't provide food. And she just kept saying to me, you know, that sometimes we just drink water. You know, so all of that pain I bottle up. And there he comes at her funeral. You know, he said, you can't bury her. And my, I met my husband when I was at university. He supported me. He helped me to go to study in the UK. You know, so I built a relation. My mother knows him. I already had a son, my only child. I have one biological child, my son. So I was building up. I had my first car. You know, so I was okay starting, you know, seeing a future in front yes. of you. Yes. Then all of a sudden, so the, the pain and the bitterness of losing my mom and the way he behaved, I just thought something in my brain says, this is not fair. Mm. So I spoke to one or two people and they said, Say, you know, you go to UNDP. It turned out it's a woman, Mrs. Zara Nuru. She's mm. a Tanzanian who was head of UNDP. People said to me, I wanted to understand what was it. Ah. Why could he do this to us if there's any fallback? So right. I went to her for understanding and yes. explanation. Then she sat me down. She educated me. She told me what was the problem in my country, what was the problem with our culture. 
I said, can I do anything? She said, yes, you can. She mm. said, you know how many women suffer? Hmm. So that was one thing. I suppose inside, somewhere inside, there's the activism. Yes, yes. Which was... The what, fire was set up now yes. at that UNDP office. Yes. Yes, something was ignited. Yes. And you decided this is now the path that my life is on. And it's also like a gift to my mom. Yes. I just needed to do something for her. Right. You know. Absolutely amazing. And how are you be able to do all of these things in the midst of a war? First of all, could you just, for, for, for us who have not experienced living in a war-torn country, even like military, military coup. Um, what is that like? And, and how do you even navigate to be able to accomplish anything in that, in that kind of environment? The city was never captured. Occasionally, I think once or twice, the rebel came, of course. Okay. Like we had January 6th, mm. the rebel came 1999, which was the closest we ever, because I, they came like 500 years from my house. You know, I had bullets oh. flying up my house. At some time during the war, I lost my house. I had to run to Guinea on a fishing boat as a refugee. I was there for 10 months. The government was overthrown in the process. And then the Nigerians evaded. And they came and we came back from Guinea, from exile. We came back. And then January, they attack. You know, it was eat and go. So every time there was a little bit of life, you know, you pick up your pieces. I mean, it was, you know, I, I always say to people, and having been in Kenya for two years, you people are lucky. And the reason why Kenya has developed to this extent where it is today, because you've never had these problems. Because when you have war, it destroys the fabric of society. Because yes. it's, it's, it's just about you, it's about your survival. survival. You don't care, you do anything you want. And so you can see the difference between countries like ours that had gone to war. So we say... You'd, you'll never want war for your worst enemy. And um, people in Kenya do not understand what they have. Peace is the best thing you can ever have. It doesn't matter. You can kill yourself. You can shout. You can yeah. disagree. Yeah. But the fact that you have peace and stability allows you to take one step to the other. Because mm -hmm. you have to build on top of things. You know, mm -hmm. the former president came. He did something. The next government come. If you take yeah. the UN, yes. for example, mm -hmm. the first person who gave us land was President Jomei Kenyatta. He mm -hmm. gave us 100 acres of land. President Arab Moy came, he gave us 40 acres. Today we have the biggest land space in the world. The UN is in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And then President Kibaki came, he gave us Yunon. This is uh, my office. Yes. It's the only UN headquarters in Africa and the global south. We provide services in 155 countries. People don't know this is the heart of UN operation in Africa. Right. So every government comes, they bill on something. President Uhuru Kenyatta comes, he will bill on something. And then President Ruto has come, he will bill on it. And mm. at the end of the day, it doesn't go out. It's Kenya. Mm. So it's, it's, why? It's because of peace. Because with peace, you bill. Yes. There's a continuation. Yes. Even if you have a stagnation, things are not moving, but you don't go backwards. No. With peace, with war, it destroys everything. Mm. Mm. And when it destroys, you can never rebuild everything. No. But the most important thing is the software. Yes. It's the mind of the people. Yes. That's what the world destroys. Yes, yes. And when it destroys that, you can't build it. Generations will suffer. My goodness. You are so... <laughs> now I feel your fire. You've transferred. <laughs> You've transferred your fire. Because you know what you're saying about you can have a good thing and take it for granted. granted. Thank you. And, and you don't realize how good it is. And you lose hope because then you become, you know, like what you're saying, it's a mindset revolution you need to have. Oh, yes. So if you don't, if you can't see it, if you're not aware of what you have, then it wastes and you waste. You know, I was in New York for five years. Right. I, I serve as special representative of the Sexy General and mm -hmm. Sexual Violence. But when I came back and I said to myself, we will never make it in Africa. You know, basic thing like internet Wi-Fi. Because, you know, so get, you take it for granted. Like in Kenya, you take it for granted. So I gave up. I said, I don't think Africa will make it. And it, it's not possible. It's just, I mean, the difference, the comparative. Then I, I got this job. I woke up and they told me, come to Kenya. When I came to Kenya, then I said, oh my God, there's another Africa. <laughs> <laughs> I said, there's another Africa. Yeah. My five-year-old grandson mm -hmm. was here in June. By the time he finished, he said, Grandma, I'm not going back. <laughs> he said, Grandma, I don't want to go back. Kenya is so green. Yeah. There's no black at camp. So take that boy back to Africa was a big problem. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. yeah. So, so Kenya is a whole different level. I have traveled almost the whole of Africa. There are very few countries in yes, Africa I haven't yes, visited. Yes. I have traveled. I've traveled to over 80 countries around the world. So I've seen the worst cases, the best cases. And I tell you, mm. Kenya, you're lucky.
My goodness. Don't take it for granted. No. No, we needed to hear it from you, someone who has been 80 countries, my God. We shall be coming to continue with that story <laughs> right after the break. Do not go too far. Welcome back. It's What's Your Story with uh, Madam Zainab Hawa Bangura. She's the Director General of the UN Office in Nairobi. And as you have heard, Kenya, we take so much for granted. We are always whining, complaining, grumbling, and just listening to what she was able to accomplish for Sierra Leone in a time of war and a military coup. Her life also being in danger, but she didn't care. She had a mission. And so you were talking about the organization and how you had to start to train the judiciary, the, the ministers, et cetera. So, you know, we, we kind of jumped that and then we went to other things, but it's fine, I have the flow. So what was that like though? So you are here in the, mi in the midst of things. Um, you want to rebuild your nation at that executive level and you ended up also serving your nation in, in, in different ministries there. So give us that journey. Of course, I was in civil society. Yes. You know, and I tried to go into politics, not very successful. So I got called by the UN to serve in Liberia mm -hmm. because the deputy um, special representative during, you know, we had the biggest peacekeeping mission in Sierra Leone during mm -hmm. the war. Mm -hmm. We had peacekeepers. Yes. He was the deputy and he did send to Liberia uh -huh. as the number one. And he's, he, Liberia was even a more a worse case scenario than us. So he said, and he wanted somebody who can support the government can help to restore state authority, to build a government. And he said to me, Zainab, I know you're experienced in Sierra Leone. I, you need to come to Liberia. I want to recruit you. So I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So I went to Liberia. My, my job was the restoration of state authority. I was working with um, 17 ministries, about 35 agencies. And my job was to help them to come back to shape, to be able to run the country. Right. So I had staff in almost all the ministries, the, on the exception of the president's office, on the exception of the foreign ministry and the judiciary, but mm -hmm. all the other ministries. I had staff assigned. It was a chapter seven, uh -huh. which means you're helping the yes. states to come back. Yes. You know, and I had staff in all the counties. You know, they had counties as well, but yes. it was 13 counties. Uh -huh. So I was only the civilian person who had staff together with the military. So putting the educational system back together, even getting people to go back and work where they are supposed to work. One Christmas, Mrs. Sally Johnson said, the president called mm -hmm. me and said, I need to pay salaries. Mm -hmm. You know, I paid salaries for the whole country in one week. She said in the 149 year history of Liberia, it has never been done even at peace time. The exams, schools started reopening. People started going to school. They were part of the West Africa exams, like you have the East yes. Africa. We have a West Africa exams council. Uh -huh. The questions came, somebody found it in a taxi. So they canceled the exam. This was the first exam they were having after 12 years. The first external yes, exam. Yes, yes. So the Minister of Education came to us and said, Madam, you need to help me with this. We yes. just need to have this examination. Yes, this yes. is the first time. So I said, okay, where are they drawing the papers? They said in Nigeria. I said, no, we don't have a plane going to Nigeria. A plane goes to Ghana. Wow. So we, we worked with them and the, the exams council office in Ghana drew the papers. So we came backwards. We said, how many villages or towns do you have exam mm -hmm. papers? We identified the secondary school. We divided them into districts. From district, we divided into county. From county, it's one country. So we prepared the exam paper in Ghana. We put them, so from the office in Ghana, we divide them to schools. And we put them, schools, we put them into districts. Into districts, we put them into counties. Yeah. We put them in a plane, it landed at Roberts International Airport. We had UN containers there, then the UN containers divide them into county, and the UN helicopter flew them to each county. They were put in the military offices. We have our military, but I went to the military. Then from the county, it was divided into <laughs> Districts mm -hmm. and then the UN police and military drove them because we had plateau at the district headquarters. So at the districts, 
We then we use UN office, the political affairs, the civil affairs, everybody, and they took the exam papers every school in Liberia. How is it that? I know. <laughs> and then the university was open. Yeah. They didn't have lecturers. <laughs> because this was a university, the University of Liberia was been closed for like 10 years. The thing about UN peacekeeping, you have well-educated people. So mm. we went to the UN mm. offices, all the UN. Yeah. Everybody give us your qualification. <laughs> Everybody give us your qualification. So they all gave us their qualification, went to start to university. Among these people, who do you want? Who do you want? <laughs> so everybody started going to lectures part-time. What? Oh, yes. So everybody became a lecturer <laughs> just so the university could open. We, the, the president, Mrs. Salif, wanted more women in the police. Mm -hmm. Then we found out that, you know, because they, you know the history of rape. Because, yes. you know, people rape. There's a lot of problems. So they wanted more women police so that you could actually be able to investigate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the, I think it was the Norwegian or the Danish who funded it. Mm -hmm. And then we started going around villages looking for girls who had dropped out of schools. And we had to work with the exams council, the Ministry of Education, prepare the syllabus and train them and brought these girls and had daycare care for their children. Because one of the things we mm. discovered when a woman drops out of school, she deteriorates in literacy because she doesn't read. She just produces children and go to the farm and work. If you don't read when you leave school, yeah. your vocabulary reduces, you don't improve it. So we had to bring them from short term course. So we brought, there's a lot of these girls who had dropped out of school, mm. brought them six months intensive training. And then we brought the women who are in the UN to talk to them, to inspire them. Yes. You have to give them self-confidence. So today Liberia has one of the highest number of women in the police. You know, and for me, in my job, in my career, one of people said to me, how do you get along so much with government? Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in New York, I worked with 19 governments, mm -hmm. South Africa, sorry, South Sudan, mm -hmm. the worst countries. And I developed a fantastic relationship with the heads of state, with the ministers, even when I came here. And people say, how do you manage? I said, I put myself in those ministers' shoes. I talk to them, I engage with them the way I would have wanted somebody to engage with me when I was a minister. How do you, because listening to you speak, you know, you're one of those people uh, are categorized as, do you even ever have low moments? Do you, do you have at least a day or two or maybe an hour or two where you sit and you're like, I can't do this anymore? There's so much um, humanity. Yeah. There's so much pain, you know. I went to, 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 to um, Iraq mm -hmm. and I had to visit the Yazidis. Mm -hmm. These were girls who were captured by ISIS. And I listened, that trip was one of the most difficult trip ever in my life. I, I left New York, I flew to Lebanon, I drove from Lebanon to Damascus. I told her I went to Syria, yes. I spent two nights in Syria. From Syria, I came back to Lebanon. Lebanon, I went to Turkey, I went to um, Gaziantep, the border with mm. ISIS. I saw mm. all those refugees, people. I spoke to the government in Turkey. From Turkey, I went to Jordan. And I saw they had one of the, some of the biggest camp. And I was in this room, I was talking to those women. Some of them just started crying. I saw somebody who had been raped like 22 times over. You know, the girls teach them and I left. I went to Iraq. I went to um, Baghdad. I mean, and I, I came down in the red zone. And I was supposed to go into the blue zone. And the armored car, the, oh, it's just unbelievable. You know, it's like you're in a war zone. I left there, I flew, I went to Arbir, mm -hmm. you know, where the, the, the Kurdistan, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 then they told me about the Yazidis, these girls who had been captured. I went, I saw them. I listened to their story, I visited their temple. I spoke to their priest, I spoke to their, pri their prince. Mm. Even as a Muslim, the trauma that I went through that trip was a two weeks trip. I just decided the only way I can go back with my sanity in New York, let me go to Aj. I spoke to the Saudi government, they gave me hospitality. I went to the mocks in Mecca. I sat in that mocks throughout the night I was crying. I just could not understand why we can hate each other so much, the extent to which we go to destroy each other. Man, humanity, inhumanity against man. And I spent the whole night in that box. I was just crying. I was praying, I was crying. I needed some form of therapy before I can go to New York. Because the pain I felt, I saw, 
in the eyes of these girls and these women. I just couldn't believe it. And after spending two nights in that smokes, I went with fire in my stomach, I was going to fight. And the interview I did was um, with Farid, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. GPS. The, the interview is mm. there, you can look for it. Mm -hmm. And I explained to the world what ISIS was doing to the Yazidis, how they were selling them as sex slaves, a pack of cigarettes you take to buy a Yazidi girl. I went to Mali, I had to go to Timbuktu. Mm. And I saw this girl, she was looking at me, she was not winking. So somebody whispered to me, she says, this is one of the girls that the, the, the ISIS people had taken and raped. So, but then what I, la I saw was that they were, men were sitting with them, as if controlling them, not wanting them to talk. So I said to the men, I said, eh, I said, you are Muslim, me are Muslim. Why are you sitting with these women? We may sit together, I say, you know what? It's Haram in the Quran, which is sinful. I want to talk to our sisters. So you men, I beg you, please, I bow down. I say, I beg you, please, allow me to talk to the women. I want to talk with them. They couldn't do anything, I'm Muslim. Mm. So they said, okay. So I said, you stay at the conference room. I took the women, I took them to the room. I sat down, I put this girl near me, because they've told me she's the most traumatized. I put her down near me. And then somebody was talking. And then all of a sudden, she started speaking. In the middle of we conversing, she started talking. She kept quiet. And when she was talking, she was leaning. She was leaning, she was leaning. And then all of a sudden, she collapsed. You know, we had to struggle to wake her up. We took her to the UN hospital and they told us she's so traumatized. We need to move her from the environment. Because she had been raped repeated times. Every time she starts thinking about it, she starts thinking she collapses. You know, so when you go through all of this scenario around the world, you see what happens. Mm. Then you come to a country like Kenya, you know how blessed Kenya is. Mm. So when you see all this pain, uh, Madam Zainab, how do you, how do you decompress? My faith yes. is the thing that has kept me. Because in the worst case, I pray. Like I told you, my experience in the, in the, in the Middle East, yeah. I went to Arj. Yes. I just went there and I went into the mosque and I prayed. Yes. And I'm not a Christian, yes. but I have a psalm book because mm -hmm. I believe in it. Mm -hmm. So where I don't have the Quran, I read the Psalms. Mm. I pray in the Christian way. I pray in the Muslim. So I don't choose because for me, God is God. Yes. All I want is for him to help me yes. go through this. What does your story look like here to four? What do you think it looks like? Or what would you like it to look like? Well, you know, for me, I think I've got to the stage of my life mm. where... Now, what I do, I say to my uh, to UN colleagues, I came, I set up the UN Women Leaders Network to help women go up, yeah. support them in the UN. Mm. Our Secretary General, we call him Mr. Feminist. Mm. He <laughs> came with one goal, to have most women in senior leadership in the UN, and he achieved that. Oh, wow. You know, at our level, we're under Secretary General, which is the third layer, mm -hmm. because you have the Secretary General, one person, you have the Deputy Secretary General, one person, and then you have us, mm -hmm. the Under Secretary General. These are head of agency, head of UNDP, head of UNEP, I the see. overall heads of this agency. We have more women in those positions, over 50% are women. And that was his goal. And mm -hmm. he, he, he took us to a seminar in New York, I think it was July, I can't mm -hmm. remember, and he said to us, I've put you in this position, what are you going to do with those positions? For us, the Africa, I said, what are you going to do for your continent? Mm -hmm. So I work in Kenya, and I want Kenya to be the best duty station. So my job is to work with the government of Kenya yeah. to make sure what needs to be done is done. You know, when we had COVID, Kenya is the medivac center for the bulk of the UN. Mm. So I walked through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, everything, it was very difficult. They don't want any COVID patients, blah, blah. So eventually, the government, the president spoke to the Secretary General, they agreed to build a COVID hospital at the Nairobi hospital. The equipment that we put in there we didn't have it in East and Central Africa, like ECMO machine for the first time, mm. because I wanted it to be the best. And we ended up bringing 50% of the global UN COVID facilities patients here, from Afghanistan, from Nepal, from Yemen, from India, not to talk about Africa, mm -hmm. because of South Sudan, this mm -hmm. is, they are here. But 70% of the patients were Kenyans. We didn't build the hospital and say, you don't have Kenyans, mm -hmm. they are just for you, and no. We build the hospital to support the Kenya respond to COVID. Mm. You mm. understand? Yes. We equipped it 
It was a 100-bed hospital, and we built it, even though we had 15 ICU beds, you know, and uh, 45 HDU, but we wired the hospital, put all the infrastructure, so if COVID gets to a stage like it was in Spain and mm -hmm. Italy, that hospital could be turned to 100% ICU bed. So it's my contribution, because at the end of the day, I'm an African, I will leave. But I, want, I don't want to build a tent hospital. Mm -hmm. I built a structure with steel and concrete, and it's there. It's going to be there for the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. You know, that's your responsibility as an African. That's how you respond. Mm -hmm. You know, now we are redesigning the whole complex. Yeah. Where the buildings that were built in 30 years ago, we're bringing them down. We're building new structures. It's going to cost about $66 million. Then we're upgrading. We, we're going to the General Assembly. I'm going to New York in the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. We're fighting to have the upgrade of our complex facilities, a $270 million project. So for me, when I'm here, I want to make sure when I leave, it becomes a better place than I took it. That's my contribution because I'm an African woman. Yeah. You understand what I mean? Totally. So I have to do the best I can. Mm. And the same thing with our staff. You know, we work very closely with the government to make whatever it is, and I intend to work very well with the next with the Incoming. new government. Yes. So to be able to make sure we work together. So the only UN headquarter in Africa and the global that remains here, this is the he global headquarter for UNEP. Today, everybody talks about environment, climate change. This is the headquarter. Yeah. So what are we going to do about it? We have to keep it and support it so that it doesn't live here. Mm -hmm. We have UN habitats, the cities. Human settlements, the headquarter is here, the global headquarter. You don't have that anywhere in Africa. Hmm. So what we have in Kenya is very unique. You have almost 73 offices, UN offices, over 40 agencies. You have, this is the only duty station in the world where you have every facet of the UN. Not in New York, not in Geneva, not in Vienna, nowhere. This Kenya, because you have global headquarters, you have UN headquarters, you have UN country offices, you have regional offices. So here we have regional office for WFP. We had regional, we have Somalia WFP. We have Kenya WFP. So hmm. it's the operation we have in Kenya. We don't have it anywhere in the in the Africa. Yeah. Then the, the complexity of all of the put together, you don't have it anywhere in the world. So that my job is how do you strengthen that? How do you work with the government of Kenya to keep it in Kenya to even make it much better? Now most offices want to come to Kenya. Mm. People want, that's why we're building six new buildings and they are going to be carbon free. We are going to have we are going to have a space for electric cars. We are bringing the next the couple of electric cars and we're having a charging thing. It's going to be the first time in Africa we have a charging center for electric cars in the complex. You know, so we are doing things just to make sure that Kenya continues to be the heart of UN operation in Africa. For me, that's what my legacy is, that's yes. my vision, so that when I leave, people yes. say, when she was here, this is what she this did. Is, yeah. So that's why I said, I don't compete with people, I compete with myself, I set my bar. Mm. You understand? I said, this is what <laughs> I want to achieve, and mm. that's what I fight for, hmm. you know? Yes. Wow, we have to go, but I have to ask one question. What are the values? that you live by? You know, um, I think humility for mm. me is very important. Mm. You know, as a human being, you don't have to think you're better off than the other person. Yes. And you cannot learn if you're not humble. Mm. And you can't earn loyalty. Loyalty, mm. you don't buy it, you earn it. So when you work with staff, you respect them, they will die for you. So for me, Humility is a very important thing. And of course, as a woman, you know, we have the thing of caring or nurture. Compassion and empathy, I always put other people in my shoes. If yes. I'm dealing with you, yes. I talk to you the way I would want somebody, uh, you, somebody to talk to me. Right. I don't start thinking, insulting you, attacking, no. I talk to you with a lot of respect. So empathy for me is very important and it's helped me because I'm a human being. Mm. You understand? Totally. And also for me, integrity, because everywhere I go, I want to be an example. So integrity for me is very important. Mm. You know, and, and, and last not the least, I, I have very content. Mm. Nothing really bothers me. I am very content with who I am. I'm very pleased with myself. Like I said, I don't compete with people. No. I decide what I want to do, who I want to be. Yeah. You know, so no, there's no peer pressure mm -mm. in me. Mm -mm. This is me. 
And this is what I want to do. This is what I want to be. It's not okay for you. Thank you. You can go your way. That's, what, that's who I am. So that way, I'm not too stressed. Hmm. Because I'm very self-contained. I grew up in an environment where we don't have food. We go yeah. to bed on an empty stomach. Yeah. That's what my mother taught me to be self-contained. So it's the same thing with I don't aim for the sky because everybody's jumping there. Yeah. No. I feel I need to be up in the sky. I go there. If I don't feel I need to be here, I'm sitting. Yeah. So you have self-satisfaction. You have peace of mind. You are not under stress because you're looking to compete to the next door neighbor. They have a chair. You know, I'm who I am. Mm. Take it or leave it. Yeah. I don't have any apology. That's it. Madam Zainab has said, take it or leave it. So humility, integrity, um, strong identity, just accepting who you are. Like, first of all, do you even know who you are? And what do you stand for? I like what you said. If you're planning to go to the sky, you'll be going. I don't need to go with you. And you only compete with yourself. I am so grateful that you chose to honor our invite um, to come and just share your story. Your story is a long story. And it has so many layers of wisdom and knowledge. And for me, what's especially captivating is just your heart for people. That is what I have gleaned from your story and just your posture of humility and just seeing everybody as a human being and of course your faith so i am just so grateful that you've come and i celebrate every milestone i celebrate that you stand for women and i'm just hoping that you know you get strength day by day to continue serving in the different capacities that life has for you heretofore so thank you so much for coming it's my pleasure thank you so much and to you watching you need to see this show again on YouTube 10 times. I mean, this is not the show you watch once. You have to watch it 10 times, and especially if you're a woman, because what we do as women is we fight each other for nothing. You've heard, just find your space, find your lane, walk in it, and just serve with a posture of humility. Thank you so much for watching What's Your Story tonight. Until next week, stay well, and God bless you.